In today's lecture, we're going to talk about DNA replication. There's three main uh, foci of today's lecture. The first one is to talk about the possible models of DNA replication, as well as the experiments that supported a proper model for DNA replication. Second, we'd like to focus on the modes of DNA replication, and specifically the proteins that are involved in that process. Last, we'd like to discuss the main differences between eukaryotic DNA replication and then compare that with prokaryotic uh, DNA replication. So what did we learn last time in class? Last time we studied basically how we discovered that DNA was genetic material. Uh, we began, you know, sort of at the beginning of the 1900s with Fre Frederick Griffith, and he showed us how uh, transformation occurred uh, with bacteria. Remember our last column here, column D is our experimental group, columns A through C are our control groups. And you should be able to walk, uh, you know, walk someone through this experiment and be able to show exactly how transformation occurred and what each control group was for. This next slide actually showed directly that DNA is the genetic material. This slide in particular, you want to know the role of RNAs, protease, and DNAs and which of these three uh, enzymes destroyed the genetic material and hence did not allow transformation to occur. Again, you want to be able to walk someone through the, the, the details of this experiment. A second experiment also showed that DNA is a genetic material, and this was something conducted by Hershey and Chase. In this one, you want to basically show how two different types of radioactivity, S35 and P32, were used to label proteins and DNA respectively, and how this showed that DNA was the genetic material. Again, an experiment you want to be able to walk someone through. We also talked about the dimensions of DNA. We talked about that uh, DNA is two, you know, two strands that run anti-parallel. <coughs> Excuse me. In other words, one strand runs in the five to three prime direction, another one runs in the three to five prime direction. Uh, if we look at the diameter of the double helix, the diameter, as you see on the right here, is about 2 nanometers. One turn of the double helix, if we look at it in a linear sense, is 3.4 nanometers, which is also 10 base pairs long. You want to know all these different dimensions. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about DNA replication now. Let's focus first on the different models of DNA replication. So Watson and Crick in their famous paper in 1953 that said, you know, the structure of DNA, at the very end of their paper, they actually had a quote that said, has not escaped our notice, uh, that basically the structure of DNA might suggest the mechanism for which DNA is replicated. It's a very interesting quote. So they didn't quite figure it out at that stage, but they alluded to the fact that they realized the structure would influence how it replicated. Watson and Crick envisioned uh, something that was eventually, you know, shown to be true, uh, again, as much as we can show something to be true in science, right? And what they did was they said, uh, they envisioned that DNA was semi-conservatively replicated. In other words, what this means is if at the top of the slide you have two old DNA strands, and then you look sort of, you know, in time, in the future a little bit, you'll see that each of the old strands is separated from each other, right? Oops, excuse me. They're each separated from each other, and then each old strand, sorry, I keep skipping around there, each old strand is used to make um, a new strand, if you see that on the bottom. So at the very bottom, you can see that once we have an old strand and a new strand, and another old strand and a new strand, then the DNA has been replicated. Now, that wasn't always known to be the case. And so before that was discovered, there were three main models, uh, you know, where people saw that, or three main models that people thought um, could um, explain DNA replication. The first is conservative replication, then dispersive, then semi-conservative. And on this model, on this slide, you want to keep in mind that anything is, that's listed on the first slide here, or the first row, I should say, so these, these blue helices at the top here on the first row, anything that's listed in that first row is blue, and then when you see blue on the second or third rows, that is literally the exact same blue strand from the first row. So it's not its offspring, but it's literally that same strand. So the point is that any new DNA that comes about on the second row or the third row in red, those are new DNA strands that were replicated from the original blue ones ultimately. It's an important color code to, to note here. So some people thought that DNA replication occurs in a conservative manner. In other words, if we had the double helix, you know, we brought the same double helix down here, a completely new double helix was made from it. So in other words, the strands did not separate 
rather they were replicated intact. So they stayed together and they replicated and made another double helix, almost like it was stamped. If you follow that to the next generation, you could see again that this is our original one still, the exact same one from the beginning. Another one's replicated from that. And then from this red one, another one's replicated here. The second type of DNA replication was something called dispersive replication. And in dispersive, what they thought was the DNA double helix disintegrates uh, and basically uh, almost like a puzzle being pulled apart. And then all the individual pieces or fragments are replicated and they're brought back together. Again, almost like taking a puzzle, you know, taking it out of a box, dumping it, replicating all the pieces, and then putting them back together to make two puzzles uh, that are identical to each other. So in this situation, each new strand is blue, red, blue, red, blue, red. The third uh, hypothesis that people had was that DNA replication is semi-conservative. And this is the one that, in the end, proved to be true, but we didn't know that at the time. Semi-conservative is saying each of these blue strands, as we illustrated on the previous slide, right? So each of these blue strands separates. Here's one of the blue strands. Here's the other one. And then from each of those blue strands, the DNA is replicated, and we get two, new, two red strands. If you continue that down, this is the pattern that you would see. So Meselson and Stahl did an experiment where they centrifuged DNA for a long time to separate uh, different forms of DNA that were replicated uh, at different points in time. Uh, the DNA was labeled with either uh, radioactive, um, actually not radioactive, but either uh, N14 nitrogen or N15 nitrogen, a light isotope, which is the 14, or a heavy isotope, which is the N15. Uh, the heavy isotope basically has you know, one more neutron right, than the light isotope. That's the difference between the two. So what they did was they did an experiment like this where they started with original DNA, you can see here in blue, and that DNA was growing in a broth of uh, bacteria, and the broth was labeled with um, nitrogen that was called N15, that isotope. So if we grew bacteria in that isotope and we you know, isolated the DNA, and we put it in a tube and centrifuged it, you could see that all of this DNA would go to the bottom of the tube and it would basically sort of, wouldn't pellet, but it would, it would you know, centrifuge down or sediment down where the heavy nitrogen would be seen, that heavy line. We don't see any light nitrogen because no light nitrogen, no N14 had been used yet in the experiment. Then what happened is they took all these bacteria, or at least a subsample, and they transferred them to a new flask. From this point on, all the media is N14 media. In other words, it's labeled with uh, N14 nitrogen. So from this point forward to the right, it's all N14. They illustrate that down here by saying that any DNA that was replicated from this point on is uh, going to be red in the picture down here. So if it's red, it's N14. If it's a blue strand, it's N15. OK, so what did they find? So in reality, what they found was, you know, each strand has one old strand and one new strand. Uh, or I should say each double helix. This double helix has one old strand and one new strand. This double helix has one old strand and one new strand. If you centrifuge them, they're all the same species, right? They're all hybrids, half and half. And basically nothing, no double helix is totally N15. No double helix is totally N14. So they would all uh, sediment to this middle value in between those two extremes. At this stage, you want to think which possible mode of DNA replication did they disprove. And the one they disproved was actually um, a type of replication uh, called conservative, right? If it was conservative, you should think about what would they have found here. So think about that for a second. What they would have found would have been one double helix is totally N15, the other double helix is totally N14, right? Because the helix never separates, it just replicates intact. That's not reality, but that's what they would have found if it were conservative. So conservative was disproved at this stage. Dispersive was still in the ballgame because each double helix in dispersive is half old, half new DNA. A different kind of half and half than uh, semi-conservative, but still half and half. Okay, so uh, on this next tube, what did they find? When we keep it at N14 broth, and we have these strands replicate again, these two will separate, the red one will, uh, excuse me, the blue one will go up here, the red one will go here. Everything new that's replicated is all red, right? keep that in mind. The blue one here, which was again, one of these blue ones here, so this blue one here moves to here, and you could see that this red one moves to here, then they're both replicated, but everything new is in red, and these are the four uh, different double helices you see here. 
Here you could tell you see two species, the top and the bottom. So this one right here, and then this one, they are um, you know hybrids, half old, half new DNA. These two here are just new DNA or N14 DNA. If we centrifuged uh, that sample, you could see that we'd have two double helices that pellet up here that are all light and two that are hybrids. At this stage, dispersive was di disproved as a possible mode of replication. If it was dispersive, you could see that we would have the same product here and the same one here, right? Because all of these would be hybrids with each other if it was dispersive. And you could visualize that by looking at uh, the previous slide from two slides ago. One thing to note, too, that if it was dispersive, that this strand would be in the middle, right, just like this, but it would be inching upwards slightly, because all, all of the hybrids, each generation would have, you know, slightly more new DNA. This is a clicker question that you should be able to answer, right? So just think about this clicker question. Which uh, mode of replication was not supported after the first round of replication? You know, think about that clicker question. If you're not sure about it, you know, contact me if you don't know the answer to that one. It's important to understand the details. This is a slide you should be able to fill in, right? You should be able to relate the top picture to the bottom picture and understand uh, exactly which possible mode of DNA replication was disproved at each point of the experiment. Another good clicker question for you. If you're not sure of this one, please let me know. Okay, if you're not sure of this one, please let me know. The next part of the lecture is going to be uh, discussing the modes of DNA replication. Uh, I'm actually going to stop the lecture at this point, and I'll post basically a second part of the lecture that will talk about this next part.